So I'm here with David Hood of Cressets Community College in High Wycombe um, in Buckinghamshire. And David has kindly offered to be interviewed as part of our two day convention for co-op schools. Um, I'm going to let you, David, tell us about Cressix and your background rather than introduce you too much. But you've been a head teacher at Cressix for some time now. Is that fair to say? Yes, Lee. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I've been here for 14 years, give or take now. When we get to Easter, it'll be 14 years. And uh, I think we should say it's been a pretty exciting journey uh, to be on, a journey of different stages. Lots of different things have happened to us and to the school, but it's been a good one. Uh, and I think we've got a good and positive story to tell. So 14 years is a good long time. And before, before that, um, what's your background in education? Where have you come up through the ranks from before your he headship at Cressex? Okay. Well, uh, a long time ago, I was a teacher of <clears throat> pardon me, English as a foreign language and then uh, modern foreign languages. That's where I came from and that's what I did. Uh, taught in Germany for a while and then came back to the UK and was in Kent for a few years. And then my career took a slightly perhaps different course from the one that um, many have. Uh, I went into local authority work. I joined the local authority advisory service here in Buckinghamshire, where I am now as the modern languages advisor. That was the mid nineties when uh, Ofsted had just started. So I got trained as an Ofsted inspector and did uh, some Ofsted inspections a long time ago as part of local authority teams. Uh, and the longer I worked in the local authority, the more I found myself uh, gravitating towards, well, away from languages and more towards supporting the leadership of schools that were facing challenging circumstances for one reason or another. And I began to find that work uh, satisfying uh, and rewarding and, and very, very interesting. Um, so that's kind of what I pursued. I ended up leaving Buckinghamshire and going to Milton Keynes and worked for that unitary authority for a few years. I looked after the excellence challenge there. That was part of the Excellence mm -hmm. in Cities program uh, in those days. Uh, and from there, I went on to Luton initially as the Excellence in Cities coordinator, uh, but ended up uh, looking after the whole secondary school improvement service for Luton. Uh, which was again an interesting, challenging and hugely educational period for me in my career. Uh, and towards the end of that time, I had the opportunity to, to act as head, to be acting head teacher for a school that was in special measures, but was on, his, on its journey out. Um, it was due to become an academy, uh, but there was a gap in leadership for one term. Uh, and, and I took that on and again, thoroughly enjoyed the experience, found it a huge learning opportunity. Uh, uh, and at the end of that time thought, well, if somebody will have me to be head teacher of their school, I would be interested, very interested. Uh, and hey presto, shortly after I went back to the local authority job, the role at Cressix came up. And I had known Cressix before because it was actually the first secondary school I'd set foot in when I started in Buckinghamshire back in 1995. So it was a kind of a, a nice closing of a circle there. We weren't cooperative then, we weren't any kind of status then other than a community school. Uh, uh, but that's really when, when, when this part of the story started. So you went into um, your local authority work kind of with the start of New Labour and all the changes that took place under New Labour and, and then all the national strategy stuff. So, I mean, just out of interest, what were some, yeah, and your work focused on leadership, what were some of the biggest leadership issues at that time that you can recall that you were dealing with? Oh, right. Uh, well, I remember talking to people in the authority and head teachers about how on earth you coordinate all the various initiatives that were going on, because at that time, it was great news, a lot of money was being spent on schools and, and on improving teaching and improving the experience of young people, raising standards, huge focus on that. But there were, as perhaps is often the way with central government, money seemed to come through different channels with uh, overlapping but different sets of expectations. And, and some schools, especially schools that were finding life a bit harder anyway, found it rather difficult to, difficult to reconcile those sets of expectations. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did in Luton was to try to organize things that, so that communication was straightforward and schools understood clearly what it was we were offering as a local authority service and what their part in it was. So we'd have a single plan, not a plethora of plans. And I think that that, that single act was quite well received and meant that we could A, have greater impact, but also demonstrate the impact of the work that we were doing. And schools were able to pick it up and make something of it. And some schools did, did a fantastic job with the extra investment that they got. Yeah, a very helpful role of the local authority there in, in sort of structuring 
systems and processes so mm. that both you as a local authority could see the value you were adding more clearly, but also you were helping schools, fight, school leaders find their way to the woods through the yeah. trees, if you like. They, that's right. And I, I think through working with the schools in challenging circumstances in, in all different roles, um, one of the problems that I sense senior leaders had was, was information overload. Mm -hmm. And they had so much to do just day to day in their schools. There was plenty coming their way just you know, through the door of their room from their own staff and their own setup. And suddenly to be receiving umpteen supportive emails and having to interpret them and stitch yeah. them together somehow just was a step too far. So, so I think I understood from that side, from conversations I'd had, how important clear communications were and trying to streamline them and make messages simple or as simple as we could do. Uh, and then relay that back to the external agencies, the DfE itself, that were sending those messages through. That, that was an important mediation role, I think. Yeah, um, I'd, I could make an aside here about whether the DfE over the long term have learned lessons about <laughs> <laughs> many emails and managing communication, but I think that's for another discussion. Probably, but, yeah. yeah, interesting. So um, tell me about, tell me about uh, Cressix. I mean, I know you've got some information to share on this. So the context of Cressix, the background of the school, what it's been like in your 14 years there, that kind of broader picture around Cressix. Okay, uh, let me just share this screen now or try to. Um... Sorry, it's not well, oh, there we go. Coming now. No problem. <clears throat> So, so one of the interesting things for me is often, I, I guess, if people hear Buckinghamshire, they think commuter belt. And if they hear sort of, I don't know, the association of Chilterns and the area of outstanding natural beauty, they, they imagine this sort of bucolic world to some extent, um, if they don't know the area. And that's probably very much a full stereotype, I would. I think... I mean, all stereotypes have some truth in them, I guess, maybe, I don't know. But I mean, there is part of Buckinghamshire that's very bucolic. Um, we are about a mile or a mile and a half away from some beautiful beach woodlands and Wickham where we are was once a center of the English furniture making industry. And there's still some residual evidence of that around. <clears throat> so we, we do have leafiness around us, but we are not leafy. We're situated very close to the M40 on the western side of High Wycombe, close to some very densely populated estates. Uh, and we were set up initially, I think, as an overspill school, as a number of schools right. in uh, the, the, the periphery around London were, as London mm -hmm. filled up, they were looking to, to locate people elsewhere. So the school was built, as it says there, in, in, in 1960, uh, built rather rapidly and rather cheaply, I think, uh, uh, to accommodate at that time about eight or 900, I think, young people who were going to be moving to the area. Um, one of the features of Buckinghamshire uh, that is retained is that it is a wholly selective local education authority. So there are, I think, about 13 grammar schools, some mixed, some single sex, and about 21 or 22 um, effectively secondary modern schools. We tend to term ourselves a non-selective secondary school within a wholly selective area, but in old speak, it was secondary modern. And sometimes I feel it's a bit more honest to say that. Yeah. Um, the school was a very popular community school for a, a long period. Um, I'm not sure that educational outcomes were especially high, uh, but it was a school that the community was happy with. And, and I think with a happy and, and, and very supportive staff to the, to the young people living in the area. Um, as time went on, um, some difficulties arose, there were changes in leadership and there was some, some unevenness, if I can put it that way, in the leadership of the school, some coming and going. Uh, and fairly rapidly, as is quite often the case actually in non-selective schools within Buckinghamshire, things started to look not too good. Um, uh, schools such as ours need to be stable and need to be in a, going in a clear and purposeful direction. And if they're not, then things can quite rapidly go downhill, we've discovered. Mm. So uh, in the 2000s, the school ended up with effectively three sorts of categorization. Uh, it was a school facing challenging circumstances. Um, that was largely due to the socioeconomic uh, makeup of the community that the school served mm -hmm. by then. Uh, it became a target school in excellence in cities. Uh, and later on in the 2000s, shortly after I arrived, also became a target school in the national challenge. 
So, so all of these things don't normally happen to schools in Buckinghamshire as a result of the characteristics that you described earlier on. We're not alone. There are, there are a small number of schools that are similar to us in various ways. Uh, but in terms of any kind of DfE benchmarking group, we, we are not with any other school in Buckinghamshire. With, we're with schools in, in, in Birmingham, parts of London, urban areas in the north. That, that's the way that we tend to get grouped when those groups are put together. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so did you have a, a raising attainment plan at that point in time through the local authority under National Challenge? How was that? Working? We did. Yeah. Uh, so that there, there were plans to do with all of those things, again, back to the business of coordination. So there was an excellence in cities plan yeah. that was run by the local partnership and there was a raising attainment plan over which we had a fair amount of control. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we focused on English and maths and doing yes, it, so yeah, I remember it well. Yeah. And we had a, a national challenge partner, school improvement partner, mm -hmm. uh, who supported us on that. Uh, in fact, we had a succession of them. Some of them knew a bit more than others, and some were more helpful than others, to be honest. So, of course, being in, you know, the, the vocabulary around this is interesting. Being a target sort of suggests that people are shooting at you. And it does sometimes feel like that. But on the other hand, what those projects brought was a very large um, input of money, mm -hmm. uh, several hundreds of thousands over the years from which we enormously benefited. And I think when we look back on it, some of the individual exchanges may have been a bit uncomfortable, but actually it brought very large benefit to us and allowed us to invest in a kind of uh, a value added structure within our school, which is about supporting young people to overcome such barriers to learning as they have. Um, in the old days, it was quite prescriptive. We had to have learning mentors and there were various mm -hmm. other roles that were prescribed. But uh, over the last decade or so, we've evolved those roles, added others to them, taken some out and ended up with, with a very powerful pastoral structure, which is focused entirely on A, getting youngsters into school, B, keeping them safe, and see supporting them to achieve well. Uh, so that, that, that real um, injection of cash was actually very, very welcome. Um, the pupil premium has replaced that to an extent, but to nothing like the same extent. Uh, and you know, if I'm really honest about the way we use pupil premium, it is to keep that part of our structure going because we have to keep it going, otherwise we, we couldn't function. In a later slide, I'll be able to show you some of the impacts of the work that we've been able to do. Um, but it is, uh, and this is a theme that I guess I'll keep coming back to, keeping the place going financially is a challenge um, with the level of support that we think it's right to provide for our young people. And it's interesting you talked about um, that money uh, addressing, if you like, the whole of your school community, because to some extent, some aspects of national challenge were geared towards certain cohorts of pupils. Um, uh, which now we look back on that, it, it seems like a very unfair system, doesn't it? Those kind of CD threshold children. But yes. what you seem to have done wisely is think about the equitable distribution of resource for your young people at school. Yeah, I, th I think what we learned early on, and actually what I'd learned before I came here was it, it's a figure of speech that somebody used in the meeting I was at, and I thought that's good. It's the, it's the rising tide lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. So I think rather than battering away at the poor old students on the CD borderline as they were, yeah. there, uh, it was far more important to focus on what was going on in the classroom mm -hmm. and make sure that, uh, first of all, students were in the classroom in a state to learn, so they were calm and focused and tuned in to the expectations that were there, and the teachers were able to manage that and had the skills in order to do high quality teaching. Uh, and then beyond that, we're prepared to offer additional booster sessions and, and, and support sessions to youngsters, which teachers in, in this school have always been prepared to do, but not be particularly exclusive about who they offer them to. Right. Uh, we, we, would, we would always be inclined to look at the data and see if there are any underachievers. But for us, underachievers would go across the board. Mm -hmm. So it might be somebody who's aiming for a three and is down at a one, or it might be somebody who's aiming for a six and is at a four. Mm -hmm. Those children in, in the light of the data that's our, at our disposal could be doing better and we'd like to give them the chance to do better. Mm -hmm. so, so that that became the, the philosophy really, or was the philosophy from the start, to be honest. Yeah. And so tell me, tell me a bit about your, your uh, student body. I mean, obviously, you've got some information here for us. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to give a very succinct uh, overview of the kind of student body we have. I mean, in the end, we're, we're, we're an urban school in a... In a, in a home county landscape, actually. 
Uh, we are relatively small, and that's deliberately now the case. We are oversubscribed and have waiting lists, and the local authority does occasionally approach us to ask us to take more students. And we have consistently said no. They do try to use the argument that it would bring us more cash, but if you, if you do the calculation, by the time you've recruited the extra staff to, 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 to provide for those extra youngsters, there's not a whole lot of extra cash in the pot. And we do believe that um, know our, our youngsters really well and um, to sound a bit twee about it, have some sort of a family atmosphere in the school yeah, sure. uh, does, does help us and it, and it helps them. It helps us all to identify with, with what we're trying to do. Uh, we are multicultural. Um, at the last census, I think we were just over 40 first languages spoken. That's probably slightly misleading in that some of those languages are spoken by individual children. Um, the, we, we, the, the, the majority of people, say about 65%, would say that they are English as an additional language, speak English as an additional language. The vast majority of those speak Punjabi at home or dialects of Punjabi, but they're also fluent in English and can transact in English. Um, the challenge is to operate in registers uh, and a more literary register in English, and we have a, a, an English team that really gets that. Uh, a number of them have come from a similar background themselves, and that, that's, a, that's a very strong focus for us. Uh, for the utilitarian purpose of trying to get through exams, but for the far more probably important or equally important purpose of making sure that our youngsters can stand tall and can participate in, in all the opportunities in, in, in life and uh, English speaking society that, that are open to them. Uh, every year we have a number of recent arrivals to the UK with limited English um, from a variety of different backgrounds. We have um, three sisters of Uyghur background who've been with us for about a year and a half. Uh, we've had youngsters from Syria and other places. We gladly open the school to more of those youngsters. I, I think as a nation, we should take more. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, they, when, when they come, they are enriching and, and, and are, are, are excellent members of our community. Um, we have uh, an above average level of entitlement to free school meals. Uh, and as you can imagine, there are um, selective schools down the road, which are the exact reverse of that. And yet we're about a mile apart. So though we're serving in inverted commas, the same community, we've, we've yeah. got very, very different profiles. Mm -hmm. um, we have quite well above average proportion of youngsters with special educational needs on, on SENK. And we've got twice the national average of youngsters with, with EHC plans. And again, we, we, could, we could easily have more because we've become quite a, a center for supporting youngsters with, with SEN. Parents recognize that. But that's something for the sake of maintaining the balance of our provision, we, we, we try to keep in balance. Uh, on average, again, probably not a great surprise in a selective area, we have below average prior attainment. And in some years have been well below average um, in English and in maths or in one or the other. Um, the profile is slightly changing, the prior attainment is slightly rising, but it still remains below average. But of course that disguises a spread. Uh, and in every year we have youngsters who are at the upper end of the attainment range. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that might make one query the validity of the 11 plus because they've sat it and not got through. And yet the scores that they show us suggest perhaps they, they could or should have done if, 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 if that's the right thing to happen. So, so we do have those youngsters at the upper end and we must keep our eyes open for that and ensure that they have all the, the chances that, that, that they need to. Um, there are and I guess this is true of so many schools, but, but a, a very urban set of issues that we face to do with domestic community and social issues. Mm -hmm. we, are, we do make a high rate of referrals to children's social care. It's quite hard to get comparative data, but on one occasion when we did, we were making about twice the number of, of the next highest school in Buckinghamshire, uh, and we never get our referrals rejected. So we think we're reading the thresholds right. Um, we do refer a lot to CAMS, we could refer a whole lot more, and I think probably again, as with every school, um, we'd love there to be greater uh, yeah. formal provision for, for mental health support for young people, there, there just is nowhere near enough. And, and um, related to your last point there, that, has that increased with the pandemic, that, that need for mental health service provision or? Uh, yes, um, it's hard to quantify, but mm. I think um, the one, the, the young people who were kind of at the, at the more extreme end who needed the, 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 the really big interventions, I'm not sure that the numbers of those have increased significantly. I think that they may become more acute, uh, but they were there before. What we have noticed is a sort of more widespread um, need for general support. Youngsters just needing reassurance and work on helping them with their anxieties and, and loss of confidence. Uh, and so we do what we can. Um, and I think we do a lot. 
uh, but uh, the opportunity to call on more specialist support at times more easily would be very welcome to help with that. And I, so it's interesting looking at what you've been saying here because you've drawn out a couple of equity issues, I suppose, to some extent, in the sense that, first of all, um, you talked about the 11 plus and the extent to which it may or may not be fair given the um, pupils who end up with you who maybe could have gone to grammar school, but also you talked about the difference between the, the two communities, your school community and its needs, compared to a grammar school that's very near to you and their needs. So I'm just wondering about the challenge of being a cooperative school in that context. Mm. Yeah, I, I think um, it would probably be more challenging if you're genu genuinely cooperative if one were on the other side of the selective um, divide. Uh, for us, uh, our, our guiding principles are that we are inclusive. Uh, we want to be a home, a school that provides for everyone to the best of our ability and, and enables all of our students to achieve their goals and to, to do the very best that they, they possibly can. Uh, occasionally, some youngsters come to us because their parents decided not to put them in for the 11 plus. Either that's a parental choice, they don't agree with it, or the child themselves has expressed a preference to come here, even mm -hmm. though there was a chance that they would have got this, got, got through. I think uh, it, it, we have observed that, that, that some youngsters who thrive with us, um, you can't do the like for like comparison because the child can only be at one school. But we are aware that there are some similar children from the same background who haven't necessarily thrived in the other setting. And there are some counter examples. There are youngsters who have, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are years when our value added overall is above that of some of our grammar schools, including one of the neighbouring ones. Uh, and uh, we do have youngsters then who go on into sixth form and get uh, very good A levels if that's what they should choose to do, and then go off to to the selective universities and get very good degrees and come back and tell us about it. So, so we see our roles very much as, as one that provides for, for all members of our community. Uh, and of course, those who are not going to take that path are equally important. Uh, and it's very important that we provide them with the basis of qualification and understanding of the world and ability to, to study further, which, which equips them to make what will be a very important contribution either to the, the, community, the local community that they may choose to stay in or or elsewhere, wherever they end up going. Yeah, and it's, it, it ties back to what you were saying earlier when we were talking about national challenge and, and targeted intervention and your point about rising tides lift all ships. Yes. That very much the, the intention at Cressix is to make sure the provision reaches all of the children where they need it. That's right, yeah, that's the line that we take, yeah. Great. Um, let's, let's sort of shift on to thinking about uh, Cressix then as a as a cooperative school so in terms of how you work cooperatively what because I guess one of the interesting things for lots of um, uh, people who are involved in the cooperative education movement is Cressix is a single foundation trust we have a few of those as members but obviously they're a small percentage mm. of membership um, and so uh, tell me about how that came about obviously you've been a foundation school with a cooperative trust now for nearly 12 years? That's right, since, since 2010. Yeah. So it's originally emerged as a consequence of the national challenge. Um, one of the requirements of the national challenge was that we needed to change status. So schools that were focuses, focuses of the national challenge had to change status. One of the options was to become an academy, a mm -hmm. sponsored academy as it would have been. And we were not closed to that at all. Um, had there been a suitable sponsor and somebody who was going to add value and who is seriously interested in working with us, then that's something that we, we could have embraced at the time. But that unfortunately never happened. And so we were, we were looking for, for other, other things. And the interesting thing was that we were looking for other things. The idea was the narrative of the, the national challenge was that we were a poor little weak school and needed somebody strong to come in and save us. Um, but those that were strong coming in to save us didn't seem to have much more of an idea than we did. Right. Uh, so we decided to take matters into our own hands. Uh, and we discovered in the paperwork, the small print, that um, the becoming a trust school was an option, ostensibly with a strong partner. And then the chair of governors, who at that point was working for the Open University, came up, uh, was working with Professor Ron Glatter, mm -hmm. who has long been associated with the cooperative education movement, and told her about it. 
Uh, and we found out more and thought, wow, this, this really appeals. We like the values, we like what it stands for, we like the energy, there was terrific energy flowing through the movement at that time, uh, coming out of uh, the Cooperative College in Manchester. And we thought, uh, if, if we can sign up for that, we will. So we spoke to our likely partners, all of whom agreed that this would be a good idea. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a bit of a rush, finally, because there was an election, if you remember, later on in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, Perda was coming and all sorts of things were happening. Uh, we got ourselves sorted out and signed the dotted line and became a foundation school with the Cooperative Trust, which was the option on offer. And that happened down at one of our partner schools, Wickham Abbey School in, in the centre of town, uh, I think in February 2010 on a snowy day. <laughs> and then we kicked off uh, on the 1st of April 2010. Uh, and that proved to be a very auspicious day for us. And I think at about the same time, David Cameron was doing his big society stuff, but mm -hmm. also speaking in Manchester about the power of cooperatives and cooperative schools. So although, as you wisely point out, this is often hidden in the fine print and Ron Glatter, who you mentioned, might actually be listening to this. So um, he'd know the detail as much as you do about what the process looked like. Um, I think a lot of schools at the time chose this as the best option available if they were in national challenge that that's right and i remember going to conferences both before we converted if that's the right word and then at subsequently in the early 2010s and they were always very well attended uh with a whole array of different schools and uh, they 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 were energizing events to go to they they were they were really good um and it felt like we were part of um to use the word again a family Mm -hmm. uh, a group of people with, with a yeah. shared set of values uh, and we talk the same sort of language. We Many of us face the same sort of challenges. Uh, and uh, as around about that time, the chair of governors and I went to see a few of the other trust schools that were setting up and learned a huge amount from them. And it's always a very great privilege to go and see somebody else's setup. Uh, and we learned a very great deal from talking to colleagues, from governors, head teachers, others who were involved in the process of setting up and how they were facing the various dimensions or dealing with the various dimensions of becoming a cooperative trust school. So at that point, we didn't feel particularly unusual. We felt really, if not quite mainstream, something that people uh, knew about uh, and was, as you say, uh, being very actively supported. Um, uh, our local MP is Steve Baker, a name that many, I guess, may have heard. Uh, and, and Steve, uh, we, we, we agree with Steve on this point that he's very much an advocate for cooperatives, including cooperatives in education. He's been a very great supporter of, of, of this journey, um, including actually organizing a, um, a debate in, in Westminster Hall in the Houses of Parliament, I think it was in 2014, in which he really sung the praises of, of cooperatives, cooperative education, and we got quite a name check there, which at that point gave us really quite a boost. Um, you know, it, it's good to be noticed, and it's good that people are recognizing that you're doing something uh, that seems to be hitting the mark. And he was able to say that, I think, in part because a while ago, um, he received a lot of letters from people living in Wickham saying, I've been told I've got to so much art of I don't want to. Uh, and the volume of that, those letters diminished. Uh, and, and then by about the mid 2010s, he was getting letters saying, I'd like my child to go to Cressex, but I can't get him in. <laughs> so, you know, he, there was some evidence there for him that what we were saying was actually bearing some fruit. And, and obviously there's, there's not necessarily a causal relationship between becoming a cooperative and this happening, but there must be some sort of correlation. I just want to wind back to something you said about uh, <clears throat> national challenge and the conversion process, because the point you made there, David, was it was almost like... Uh, it was considered we needed to be done to at that top point in time rather than being able to make the decision for ourselves and obviously one of the most significant aspects of being cooperative is this sense of self-responsibility yeah. that you you um you are accountable internally to each other and to the wider family of schools or the connections that you have but that doesn't necessarily mean there is an external someone who is the key agent of change. That's correct. I, I think you've got to retain some humility. One has to, we have to retain a measure of humility on this. We, we don't know all the answers, 
but uh, in our school, we sit in the community that we serve. We have a lot of uh, people directly from the community working in the school. They, they understand this part of Wickham. They understand the issues. Uh, and a lot of the people who came through the door in the early days were full of good intentions, but they weren't really speaking a language that, that made a whole lot of sense to us. So it wasn't a question of just giving them the cold shoulder and sending them through the door, but it was a question of, of listening, nodding, smiling and saying, fine, uh, but there may be another way of looking at this uh, and we will argue for it and we will demonstrate and we will, we will stick to our principles. And of course, if, if it fails, it fails and we'll pay the consequence. Um, but we, we did believe, firstly, that you know, we were paid to be in charge, we wanted to be in charge, so let's get on and be in charge. Uh, but also, um, it could be argued that the kind of community we serve generally is a sort of, has been a bit of a done-to community. Mm -hmm. And if one of the messages we're trying to give and spread through our community school is that we stand on our own two feet and we stand for ourselves and make our own future, then, then us modelling that to an extent and bringing people on board and showing them how it's done that has had, I mean, whether it was as conscious as that at the time, it's hard to say, but I think right. that there was an element of that in our thinking. Uh, and um, we do stand tall now, uh, and, and, and the building, you know, you see the picture there of the lovely new building that we got in 2010. The old building wasn't like that. So it was a very low structure and kind of huddled rather sheepishly behind some tall trees. And now, you know, we, we stand rather proudly on the top of the hill, and that's the way we like to envisage ourselves, that we're at the the center of the community and model certain behaviors for the community and um, the community joins in and all of that I think is, is a good thing. Yeah I mean it's, it sounds like you've described if you like some of the unique selling points or what makes Cressic stand out there so that emphasis of being rooted in the community but like a, the beacon on the hill at the same time um, the fact that you have a community that has felt done to but the way you work builds and gives agency to the community you serve seem very significant are there any other of your unique cooperative points that you'd like to say well you haven't mentioned this one lee phillips what about this <laughs> i mean i wouldn't like care to say that these things are, are unique because i know these things happen in all schools but we we do try to you know demonstrate social responsibility again through the work primarily with our with our own youngsters and with their families uh we do i think i hope show that we we care for others similarly uh, and also internally where people are going through tough times and of course covid has been a tough time for many including those on the staff some of whom have lost um, family members and of course if we know that there were uh, the data seems to suggest i'll put it that way that there were certain groups in the community who in the early days of covid were more susceptible to it and more likely to suffer serious illness and die uh, and it is certainly the case that some of our colleagues lost um, parents who maybe weren't that old to covid in, in the early days so we've done what we can to, to care for them as best we can uh, we try to be as, as open as anybody reasonably can running a, a public organization and we try to be straightforward and honest about what we do. Doesn't always make, our, make, make us friends, we've discovered. Um, you know, sometimes dishonesty seems to be valued more than honesty. Or, but uh, I think on the whole, it's, it's, it's better to say things as straight as you can, mm -hmm. uh, because then everybody knows where they stand. And if that means they're going to start pushing back hard, then at least that's a position as well, rather than everybody pretending that they agree when actually they don't. Yeah, and, and you talked about the word family being potentially sounding twee, but actually what you're talking about is a fairly robust family here, mm. because you're talking about a degree of challenge, but also that support. And given the, the community um, you have and the community that, that sounds like it makes up your staff body too, we haven't touched on that, I realise now speaking to you the the impact you're talking about with the pandemic that's right so of course in not just our staff but a number of our students have been similarly affected with yeah. really parents who really aren't any age at all having succumbed or become really very ill so um so all of these things have been you know things that we've dealt with as all schools have in the last couple of years or so uh, but i hope the underlying attitude and mindset is the one that's permeated what we've tried to do for the duration yeah, and, and in terms of, we've, we've sort of been talking about the pandemic here, and obviously all schools have that story of the pandemic and, and probably the exhaustion that staff have felt from it and the ongoing anxiety culture that we've also mentioned. It's, it's very hard for me to 
segue into positives from the pandemic because it seems like um seems a bit specious to try and draw that out but nonetheless you've probably made some changes that are beneficial in one way or another well i i think it is possible to segue that way because um i'm going to flip to the next to a uh just take us through a couple of slides so um here you go this 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 is so for all, we have all the cooperative values that we can list, um, but I think they're quite nicely expressed in this, this one phrase that is not an invention of mine. I nixed it from a school in Luton whose work I enormously admired. So when I came here and I felt we needed a sort of binding set of words, this is what I offered to, to the staff and the governors. And we all said, yep, that's fine. So in the end, this is what we're striving to do every day. Um, and, and we define achievements uh, in relation to everything. So it's about, uh, yes, learning your subjects and doing well in exams, but it's about being a good member of the community. It's about being a good boss. It's about being a good student. It's about being a good everything. And we're all supporting everybody to, to do that. Um, I was just busy enjoying those smiles of delight. Yeah, okay. <laughs> do you want to go back? <laughs> yeah. Smiles of delight. I mean, yeah. because most of those you can, you can see are entirely genuine. You know, they are uh, they capture those moments of, yeah. of joy. No, I always run around irritating everybody with my camera, just sort yeah. of sticking it, you know, rather too close to them when we get results. And you I, know, think, I are... think certainly that uh, the young man in the middle there is more than happy to have his photo directly taken. So absolutely. And the young woman at the bottom who's leaping, well, she looks like she's very tall, but actually she's very short. And that's a spontaneous oh. leap of delight. Oh, OK. Uh, and that was um, that was actually in 2010. So the, the first time students came into the brand new school before we started in the new term in September was the, the August results day. So she actually had had her whole five years in, in the previous school. Right. Yep. So, so that's kind of our binding thought, really. That's, that's what we're striving to do each and every day. Um, and I'm gonna flip over this curriculum uh, statement to, uh, to sort of evidence of what we've managed to achieve mm -hmm. over the last um, nine, 10 years. So on the left-hand side is where we were at in 2010, and 2019 is obviously the last year when we had consolidated data around results, uh, examination results. And what I'm trying to say here is, oh, oh gosh, have we done well in terms of improving things? But also what we have is a solid basis, a solid basis to bring students back into and to provide for students during difficult times. And I think we, we discovered that when we went into lockdowns that really quite rapidly we were able, for example, to gather ourselves together and get um, high quality remote teaching going. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to draw on our own resources to get laptops out to students who didn't have them. So if we'd waited for the government laptops to come, we might arguably still be waiting now, uh, but we had a supply of laptops that we happened to have in storage covers that we weren't using. Uh, which was very fortunate. They did need some work on them, but we, we, we found out very quickly who didn't have a laptop, didn't have internet connections, and, and we were able to, to provide them with those. Uh, we were able to set up behavioral expectations uh, for remote learning, which we were able to enforce. We were able to set up um, attendance routines for remote learning, which we were pretty much able to enforce. Uh, and we had a, a strong in-school provision for vulnerable students as well. So, um, you know, in, in building a journey that takes you to this point, what you've done is set up six systems and structures that are uh, solid uh, and, and do survive stress tests, mostly anyway, so choosing his words advisedly. Uh, and you've got a staff who understand that they can be successful, that they know what success looks like. Um, so I guess the, the positive to take out of the pandemic is that by and large, um, youngsters seem to like school, they seem to be happy to be here. Whenever we've had a return following lockdowns, um, some schools have reported some really quite difficult behavior amongst pupils, but mm -hmm. we haven't. There may have been some individuals who've struggled to adjust who we've had to work with and, and, and deal with matters arising, but, but generally speaking, the climate has been very positive uh, and collegiate you know, among the students uh, and um, among the staff and, and, and within the community. Um, it's not to say as we move towards the end of a tiring half term, there aren't some fallings out and, you know, we're, we're a real a real community and things can go wrong. Uh, but generally speaking, the systems and structures and processes, including this augmented provision that I spoke about arising from the earlier projects, has, has helped us to be a kind of secure organisation and um, a home for the family, away from the family home. 
So, uh, so that's, if we needed to prove it to ourselves, I guess we've proved that to ourselves, but also much more importantly, we've managed to provide that continuity of provision for, for the youngsters. Uh, and it certainly hasn't been seamless. There are definite gaps in learning that a number of youngsters are demonstrating, um, but they have come back into lessons and, and they've, 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 they've got going uh, and teachers have got going very well supporting them too. Yeah, and interestingly, although we're, we're obviously looking at the, the sort of the table stakes data to some extent here, right? Um, when you're talking about your school and your community, you do mention that, but often what you're talking about is young people being at home in your school. Mm. That kind of broader sense of what the school offers children yeah. and teenagers. Yeah. And I, I think te teachers do that very well. Obviously, that some that their time is limited because they've got very very busy days. But we have this um, th this wider staff that I keep coming back to who really um, do act in loco parentis, um, both for some of our students and also for some of the students' parents. Right. Uh, that there are some students whose parents do find life very difficult, uh, and as um, colleagues' confidence is built in the roles that they have, and as as the community has built confidence in them. We're able to have some very frank, but also supportive conversations to try to help families through difficult periods. Um, so it could start as, as something as simple though complicated as a child is not coming into school, the child needs to come into school, but it can go from there to a whole array of other things, which um, we try not to go beyond our competence and, and, and we never should, but, but do try to help families deal with whatever the issues are that they're facing that, that then is, one, one consequence of which is the child is, is not coming to school anymore. And uh, there are some good case studies that I could share. And I'm not gonna pretend we're success, successful every time, we're not, um, but, but there are a number of instances and quite exceptional instances of youngsters who maybe came to us from another school or joined secondary school, having had a very patchy experience of primary school who, who have really warmed to their theme and, and got to the end of secondary school and, and, and left you know, with a creditable set of results, something that serves them for the next stage, but also equally importantly, kind of pre prepared for life and able to, to take themselves on to the next stage. Yeah, and obviously your, your data speaks to your inclusion and that kind of sense of wraparound care, I suppose, that you have both academically and pastorally for children and their families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have another slide to go to or shall I leave? Well, uh, I was going to flip back to this one about the curriculum. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the great privileges I've had in my career is, is to work with some absolutely outstanding head teachers and other colleagues in other settings. Uh, and um, I, I tend to highlight my Luton period, but I think that was because I was kind of ready for Luton when I got there. It's a very, very interesting place to work. And there are some exceptionally strong schools there. Uh, and uh, a colleague who's head of one of those schools came to share some experience with us because there was a time sort of in the mid 2000s when it felt like we were making headway in a number of areas, but our results had got stuck and we, we, we weren't actually getting the outcomes we thought that our, our efforts deserved. Uh, uh, and I spoke to this, this colleague and said, look, um, what was your journey? What have you done? How have you got from where you were to where you are now? Uh, and he came and spoke to staff at a, a, a twilight session one day and shared some stuff around work they'd been doing then on their curriculum, what they wanted their curriculum to be and to do, and talked about some work that he had done with staff that had led to a very beautifully expressed paragraph about what, what the school was trying to achieve with its young people. Uh, and so I, I tried to do the same thing and, and failed abysmally to come up with a beautifully succinctly expressed paragraph and ended up with a whole load of descriptors. And, uh, and I tried to weave them into sort of felicitously expressed sentences and failed, as I say, abysmally. I thought, you know what, this is what the staff at Cressix, all of us say we're trying to achieve. So let's just do this, you know, let's write these words. So, so this, these are not my words, they were generated in the course of a very um, positive discussion with, with, with the colleagues who were in the school at the time, back in about 2015, 2016, I think. And it became the basis then for an early statement that we made about our curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, and my contribution was to be emphatic to colleagues that the curriculum is not just in university commerce, English and maths and science lessons. It is everything that we do in school. So the total ex experience of school from the moment they walk through the door to walk home and sometimes beyond, frankly, is, is the curriculum. It's what we're trying to teach and demonstrate and model for youngsters. 
And so people bought into that, got that, and then they said, right, well, if that's what it is, then this is what we're going to try to achieve. And um, it's, it's, it's rather wonderful, actually, when you see you know, youngsters demonstrating so many of these characteristics, and we love to take credit for all of them, and everything that they show is a product of our wonderful work with them. Not true. Uh, of course, they bring many of these, uh, these uh, as aspects of their character themselves. Uh, but we, we can also track through, you know, impact of conversations had, hard work done to, 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 to demonstrate in, in cases where youngsters have really moved forward um, as, as, as in, in, in the development of their character. And, and in looking at this, it's very interesting because there are some things that stand out where you think where I think about the kind of the cultural literacy, knowledge based curriculum pe period that we are now living through. Um, where kind of no more, remember more is the mantra that you hear in primary schools up and down the country, not all primary schools, I have to say. And some of that's here, David, you know, knowledgeable about, about the world, mm. uh, committed to self-improvement, self-discipline, they would all neatly fit, but it, it's got so much more breadth than a simple measure of um, intent, implementation, impact. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what we're trying to do. I think, we believe in knowledge, <laughs> what, a, what a trite thing to say, but we do. I mean, you, yeah, you can't sure. get through life without knowing, knowing stuff. Uh, and, and the fact of knowing stuff allows you then to manipulate and, and, and to operate at higher levels. But, uh, but you're right, there's much more to it than that. And, um, you know, the, the, the employer of the future does want to know that you know some stuff, but is also, as we know, very interested in um, who you are and how you present and what you can do. And actually, one of the most rewarding moments I had was... Um, we had a couple of brothers who, first of all, didn't come to school at all, so we had zero influence on them. Uh, and then they did start to come to school, but found school difficult. And through the fantastic work of, of a combination of the, the pastoral team, a particular member of that team, and, and the teachers who taught them, they did make it to the end. And, and the last time I saw them was, um, I'm not a frequent visitor to Wickham Wanderers Football Club, but I went to watch a match. And, and who was running the, the food stall underneath the stand, but these two lads on their own, uh, dealing with you know, the whole array of customers you're gonna get at a football match. And they were dealing with quite a stressful situation, absolutely charmingly, effectively. And it was so impressive to see how well they were, they were mastering that difficult situation potentially. And I think what, at that point, one of them was 18 and one of them was 16. You know, it was it was very, very impressive. Actually, I couldn't have done it. Yeah. Uh, fifth line down, creative, resourceful, resilient, hardworking. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All of that yeah. was being all shown by those boys. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. I mean, in a way, this is a really neat place to end on. But before we before we end, obviously, one of the one of the reasons we've been talking recently, David, is is in part to do with, I guess, the changing landscape of education in England and the pressure we had from the then Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, who was seeming to imply that the landscape across the breadth of England would be academised in a very short period of time. Obviously, Gavin Williamson um, was replaced by Nadim Zahawi. That's my polite way of describing what happened. And, um, and it's gone a little quieter. But, but nonetheless, that kind of implication of academization rather like the Nicky Morgan period when it was being implied then too is back as as a cooperative foundation trust I, I my impression is at the moment you're very happy with where you are and I just wanted to talk a little about or you to share with me your thoughts around that and the thoughts of your trustees and governors around that and and if you like the the implications for other foundation trusts and what yeah. their thinking might be and whether you've got any advice for them. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, we, we do horizon scan and try to read the future as you've just <laughs> very eloquently done. And it's quite hard, isn't it? I mean, there've been mm -hmm. times before that uh, academies was just around the corner and there'd be no choice. In fact, we've been bidden to various talks where that seems to be the message and then it's, it's ebbed away again. So, so what we do um, is pretty much every year, um, sometimes with enormous thoroughness, sometimes a bit more superficially, if we look at the benefits or otherwise of becoming an, an academy, whether there's a, a multi-academy trust in the locality that um, it would make sense for us to approach with a view to joining, and weigh that against the benefits of being a trust school, a co-op trust school. And I suppose we're slightly biased in the sense that we, 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 we work towards creating the co-op trust in the first place, but, but we cannot see the benefits of 
other things over and above what we have now. We've got a really strong committed partnership of, of within the trust. Um, there, there is another, there's a, an independent school who are a, a great um, friend, colleague, supporter. They, 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 that's Wickham Abbey School. I've mentioned them already. Mm -hmm. There's the local university, Buxton University, to which an, a fair number of our students go and who provide excellent um, experiences and opportunities to, to gain insights into higher education. Uh, there is Henley College, a sixth form college over in Oxfordshire, which, which many of our youngsters will go on to uh, post 16. Uh, there's the cooperative college itself, there's the local authority, so, and, and there's a community member too. Uh, and, and that's a really strong group um, who've stood by us through all sorts of, um, sometimes vicissitudes, but also, of course, the good times. Uh, and not just, you know, in a distant way, they've been there in, in person. And they do provide fantastic opportunities, those that can, for our young people from which they, they really benefit. So we just think, for as long as we can hang on to it, let's hang on to it uh, and um, we are trying I uh, hope we'll have some success to, to through Steve Baker to, to influence thinking in terms of whatever white paper might be being thought about um, uh, in Westminster at the moment uh, to say look you, you valued diversity in the past you've told us how important it is to have a diverse system mm, maybe there's some value in di valuing diversity now because there are different models that, that, that thrive and succeed um, we read something by Baroness Barron. Um, I think you know what her role is, perhaps more than I do. Yeah, uh, she's the she's the Academy's minister. She sits Academy in the House of Lords, but she's yeah. the Academy's minister. Yeah. So we, we read something in Schools Week a couple of weeks ago that suggested that she was um, trying to make overtures towards the maintained sector, seeing that there was value in the maintained sector and what we could offer. Uh, we would agree with that, of course. Um, so we would a want to assert the value of what we do and 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 hope that they'd recognize that, uh, uh, but, but also be never close our mind to the idea that we might either need to or want to be something else. So we keep doing the thinking and would do more due diligence if, if we needed to. Um, were we to need to become an academy, the, the ideal would be to be in a cooperative academy. Sure. Um, we're a bit geographically remote from, from other cooperative schools, so that might be rather challenging, but you know, in these days of, um, uh, uh, distant communications, yeah. clever communications, who knows what might be possible. Yeah, I mean, I think a really interesting point you yeah. made there is if you can get your MP on side, get your MP on side. Mm. Um, yes. And certainly uh, a, a trust um, who is attending and is doing some work for this convention, Axia Learning Alliance, in the South Ribble, so just south of Preston, they've had their local MP mm. in, who is now also very interested in cooperative foundation trusts. So I think right. sharing we are small, but we do get great results and sharing that information yeah. with people who matter is important. Yeah, and, and through the MP, we're also trying to get a ministerial visit. We've had some sort of sign that, that we might have had some success or he might have had some success on our behalf in achieving that. So we're just trying to stake a claim to be noticed, really, and say, you know what, you know, what do you really want schools to do? Presumably you want them to be solid members of the community, educate young people well, prepare them well for life, come and have a look at the way we're trying to do that. Yeah, and, and I think you struck an interesting point that I'd like to end on really around governance when you spoke earlier about we had people working in the school who kind of were in, were enthusiasts in some way, but didn't necessarily know the, the community. And I, I suppose what's happened over the past decade is there's been maybe a shift too far away from what you have at Cressix in that you we've got had the professionalization of trusts. So we have lots of people who come from FTSE 100 companies or financial services or other sectors. So we have a great deal of wisdom, which is phenomenal around all financial matters, but the understanding of the local community or the educational needs of the young people might not be there as solidly in some trust bodies as in others. And certainly when you work locally in the community, you have that voice more. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Uh, um, I mean, it, it's taken us a while, but we now have three parents on our governing body. Um, that's taken us a long time. For a long time, we had no parental representation, really no community representation, other than through perhaps staff members who would join the governing board from time to time. But again, I suppose that's building the commitment and the understanding and the belief in what the school's trying to do and, and, and people coming forward and say, yes, I do have a voice, my voice will be heard. And that's been an undoubted strengthening. 
Um, up to that point, I guess we did have to rely on people who were experts in certain things, but yeah. lived in other places. But we tried to educate them about the community so they knew what it was that they were contributing to. So it wasn't abstract in a way. We made sure they were in school, seeing the school in action uh, and talking to colleagues who really get it from the community perspective so that they were, they were understanding that as they also offered the other expertise that they brought to it. David. It's been really interesting talking to you. Thank you ever so much for uh, sparing an hour of your very precious time as you come towards the end of this half term. Um, thank you ever so much. Thanks, Lee. It's been a pleasure. All the best.